You are listening to the Happiest Lives Podcast with Jill Lillard, episode number five. Welcome to the Happiest Lives Podcast, where you'll learn to think better, feel better, and become the woman God says you already are. Here's your host, Jill Lillard. Hey, hey, everybody. This month, we are discussing how to have a happy life. And I wanted to deep dive on this topic as there are a lot of misconceptions, perceptions, and definitions of happiness. And since my business is called The Happiest Lives, The Happiest Wives, it makes sense to talk exclusively about happiness at least one time, right? We'll talk about it throughout throughout a lot of the work that we do, but I don't think I've ever just devoted a teaching, a course, a lesson to this subject of happiness And so that's going to be this month's topic on, of the podcast all month. And it's also going to be our topic of coaching in clarity and courage, the work that I'm giving you, the application, the scripture study, and the live coaching and worksheet workshop are all going to pertain to happiness, which also involves unhappiness. You can't have positive without negative. You have to have one for the other one to exist. And so I want to be clear about how I am defining happiness as you consider what happiness means to you. I'm posing the question, what is a happy life? How do you define that? What comes up for you when I say the word happy? In 2018, I started my company. And when I was deciding what to name it, I thought of all the people who had sat in my therapy office through the years telling me I'm just not happy. They weren't happy with their marriage or their job or a friendship that they had. And that statement had an implication. It implied that they thought they should be happy. They should be feeling better than they were. They may, maybe they shouldn't have these negative feelings. And so I know happiness is important to all of us. We all, we want our children to be happy. We want to be happy. And so what does that, what does that exactly mean? And so I proposed this as one of the names for my company, the happiest lives, the happiest wives. And some people really liked it and other people didn't like it at all. A few people mentioned like, yeah, I don't know about that. And I, and I understood, I knew where they were coming from. Even still, it was the name that won. And ultimately I did choose to name my business. Interesting enough, I have sometimes caught myself cringing at the name a little bit, even though I picked it, I only do that when I'm imagining what other people are interpreting that to mean. If I think that people are taking the happiest lives to mean that you don't have negative emotions because I don't believe that at all. I believe we, we all have a negative emotions and that they are an important part of our life. And I'm willing to feel the negative emotions. I value the negative emotions. I don't share many personal pictures or antecedents about myself on social media. Still, there have been times I posted pictures of my family, or I have favorably talked about my husband. And when I've done that, sometimes they feel a little bit sensitive that it might stir up some insecurities in somebody else. Even so, I know how somebody else feels about my post. That's based on their thoughts. My pictures, words, and thoughts aren't what causes negative emotions or insecurity within someone else. It is always what they think about what I am sharing. Now, by no means is my life all sunshine and roses and beauty. We all go through challenging things. And this is the nature of being human. To be human is to have the 50-50, the positive and the negative, the happy and the unhappy. We feel happy. We feel sad. We love, we argue, we laugh, we cry. We all have mountains to climb and valleys to walk through. This is life on earth as God allowed it to be. If we're feeling unhappy, we may compare and despair, looking for evidence that we're getting the short end of the stick. Now, we can't control other people comparing or making assumptions, and I don't want to convey that life is supposed to match some sort of perfect picture when I talk about the happiest lives. When envisioning what it means to have a happy life, I am also not promoting hedonistic values void of biblical truth. People often say, well, just do what makes you happy, or I want my kids to be happy. 
And I want my kids to be happy. I want people to be joyful about the decisions they are making in their life. But that doesn't mean I want them to find the quickest dopamine hit at the cost of what will make them truly happy in the long term, which I believe is always honoring biblical values and commitments above pure, selfish, short sighted gratification. Happiness is not typically found in what immediately satisfies us. We're never happy when our happiness is at another's expense. Although the joy we experience, true joy, it is because of the price Jesus paid on the cross that was at his expense. We're all part of the body and Christ is the head. And when we plug into that, when we serve and love others and build others up, we're not just looking out for selfish gain. That doesn't mean we're trying to people please and make other people happy because seeking the approvals of others is not a recipe for happiness because what we think others want us to do, that may be different from what they need or what they actually want. Thus, the only way to find true happiness is to keep plugged into Christ as the head. And in that way, we can edify the greater whole. We can build up the body. We can encourage others and we can have a view of ourselves as part of something bigger than just ourselves. Now, happiness, we cannot fake it or force it. We can't chase it. We'll, we will always be chasing happiness if that's, if that's what we're doing we must be willing to open ourselves up to positive emotion, right? Because I think a lot of times we hold on to negative emotion or we block positive emotion. And so we want to be willing to feel peace and joy, even when we're experiencing negative emotions. Now that's very different than pretending and trying to power your way to a more positive place. As a kid, I was asked to be the flower girl at a wedding. And if you're a flower girl, you are going to be included in all the pictures that are taken. And let me tell you, there are a lot of pictures taken at weddings. So I was asked to smile in all of the photographs. And this was something I had never done before. I had never been a flower girl. And back then, people didn't take pictures the way we take pictures now, right? So my children have grown up with cameras in their faces and we're constantly taking pictures of them. My teenagers have learned to smile since they were babies. It's just the culture we live in. But back then people weren't putting cameras in your face all the time. So in the seventies and early eighties, I, when I got, when I was asked to be in this wedding and told that I needed to smile for all the pictures, it, it felt like a lot of pressure. It was awkward. I felt uncomfortable. And my brain was trying to process what it meant. I had never digested this experience before. And so I was just thrown into the situation and told that I needed to smile. And I found myself resisting it. I didn't feel like smiling. It felt fake. It didn't feel genuine. At the wedding, my parents took me aside and they used my first and middle name, Jill Marie. So I knew this was very serious. They firmly told me it was a privilege to be in this wedding and that I needed to smile and stop being so stubborn and uncooperative. I needed to shape up and get with the program or Jill Marie would have a reason not to smile when she got home. Still, I didn't smile. I promise you, I was not trying to be selfish or uncooperative. I remember the car ride home and it was quiet and it was long. I say all this to say, I'm not a promoter of acting fake or trying to look a certain way. I want you to operate with sincerity in all you do. And I want a congruence inwardly and outwardly in the life that you're living. That's super important. Now, as an adult, I would have smiled at the wedding. So if you want me to be in your wedding, I'm kind of old to be an attendant people's wedding, but I would smile. because it honors my higher values. But as a kid, I was under frozen under that professor, that pressure to perform. Now, mom and dad, don't feel bad if you're listening to this podcast and thinking, oh, we didn't understand all of this that we're going on. We just thought you were being stubborn. It's okay. It's all right. We're all, we're all doing our best. And you have to, that's how I learned that you have to smile at weddings. I, I know that now. So to be happy does not mean there's no room for sadness and sor- or sorrow. 
or that laughter is better than crying. Now, I certainly would not name my business the most sorrowful wives or the saddest lives because that's different. That's not something that everybody wants. Our goal is not to be sad and sorrowful. Still, it is an essential part of life. Jesus was a man of many sorrows. He was despised, rejected. He was acquainted with grief. Sorrow is part of our life and we must learn to walk through it gracefully. And when we're willing to walk through it, we will find hidden treasures in those dark places. When we live a life to please the Lord and we do things his way, we will experience more happiness, joy, peace, and contentedness than we could have otherwise. And so these times when we're walking through those valleys, these are the times we turn toward him and we trust in him and we wait on him. But those moments aren't the end of our story. There are three motivators that drive humans to seek pleasure, avoid pain, and to be efficient. We want to be happy. We all want to feel good. This isn't something to be ashamed of. The Lord wants us to feel good too. And that's why he's given us parameters and boundaries for how to live our lives. He does it for our well-being. It was for their benefit when he told Adam and Eve to enjoy everything in the garden, but one tree at the heart of happiness, our contentment and satisfaction, a joy, not contingent on our circumstance. We want to have an internal locus of control rather than relying on forces outside of us which would be an external locus of a control to define how we feel. Scripture is full of passages about joy, gladness, happiness, contentment, and peace. So if you're inside my coaching program, Clarity and Courage, you know each month I provide you with a scripture study of the monthly topic, and this month is no exception. You will find that scripture has a lot to say about happiness. It tells us to rejoice, give thanksgiving, offer the sacrifice of praise, worship God, These are all central to the Christian life. The Bible also addresses sadness, sorrow, and suffering as a natural part of life, guiding us, and and it guides us how to cope with these emotions. In our difficult places, we can find comfort in the Lord. And oftentimes, he will provide relationships for us during those times that can strengthen and encourage us. The Lord will encourage us during trials and difficulties if we feel all alone. Gifts are developed within us during trials that ultimately make us happier people. Today, I want to share five biblical principles for living a happy life. As this concept is interwoven throughout scripture, there are so many passages we could choose from, but I'm going to constrain to five concepts. The first biblical teaching on happiness is that true happiness comes from a relationship with Jesus. We can strive and seek and search for things to fill us and make us happy, but those things, they will always fall short. As a teenager and young adult, I loved the book of Ecclesiastes. I said it was my favorite book of the Bible. I remember saying that, feeling that, thinking that in college. And some would say, man, that's a really depressing book. But maybe it resonated with that melancholy part of myself that I was in touch with, the reality that this isn't our home here. It has the message that everything is meaningless, 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 says the teacher. Everything's a chasing after the wind. This really resonated with me. The falling leaf, the passing vapor, nothing seems to last. The fading tan, you can get a tan and it's going to fade away. You can pull your weeds outside and they're going to come back. You can love people and they can leave you. Life is meaningless when we don't have a relationship with the Lord. The pleasures of life will not satisfy and fulfill us. In Ecclesiastes, the writer, the teacher set out to test what would make him happy. And so he consciously ran a little experiment. For a time, he focused on pursuing pleasure, hedonistic pursuits, filling himself with good food, drinks, women, parties. And at the end of the day, he found that all of this was meaningless, a chasing after the wind. Then he set out consciously to pursue a life of responsibility. Now, I imagine him being driven toward goals, producing successful outcomes, making achievements, focusing on discipline, but he found that this too was meaningless, a chasing after the win. And really his conclusion in the whole book 
was that we should fear God and keep his commandments and that we should enjoy our inheritance from the Lord, food, drink, and relationships. These are all gifts from God. Neither success nor pleasure should be central to our existence. At the end of the day, our relationship with the Lord should be the one thing because without him, it doesn't matter what direction you go. The end is the same. Psalms 1611, you make known to me the path of life in your presence. There is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. In a relationship with the Lord, when we are in his presence, we are going to find fullness of joy. Psalms 37, four, delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. So if we seek the Lord first, we will also experience a byproduct of being more fulfilled. His way is the best. Psalms 144, 15, happy are the people who are in such a state. Happy are the people whose God is the Lord. Is Jesus Lord of your life? Is he the one that you are surrendering to and thirsting for? If he is, you will find happiness as you abide in this relationship with him daily. The second principle I want to talk about for living a happy life is that happiness comes from living a righteous life. The Bible teaches that living a life according to God's will is what brings us happiness. Proverbs 3.13, blessed is the one who finds wisdom, the one who gets understanding. Psalms 1, 1 through 2, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And on his law, he meditates day and night. Are you meditating on scripture? Are you hungry for God's word? Proverbs 16, 20, those who listen to instruction will prosper. Those who trust the Lord will be joyful. That's a powerful promise that God is giving us in his word. The third principle is material possessions do not bring lasting happiness. The Bible warns that when we make money the center of our life, when we make money and our when we love money and our primary goal is to acquire material possessions, then we're not going to find happiness. We're going to be exhausted and discontent. Now, this isn't to say that money is a bad thing. Money and possessions can be a blessing from God, and we can enjoy the benefits of money. Ecclesiastes 5.10 says, whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. But then in Ecclesiastes 5.19, a few verses later, it says, Moreover, when God gives any man wealth and possessions and enables him to enjoy them, to accept his lot and be happy in his work, this is a gift from God. So God does give us material things, and he is the one who enables us to enjoy those things. But we don't want to make those things the source of our happiness, the center of our world, the pursuit of our hearts. Number four, happiness comes from helping other people. Acts 20, 35 says, if everything I did, I showed you by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words of the Lord Jesus himself, it is more blessed to give than to receive. So we are instructed to help those weaker than us and receive this giving as a blessing. Proverbs eleven twenty five. 25, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. And Luke 6, 38, give, and it will be given unto you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Second Corinthians 9, 7, each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion for God loves a cheerful giver. Are you giving from a place of joy or are you doing it out of compulsion reluctantly because you feel like you have to, it makes a difference. It's not just the action that matters as much as where it's coming from in your heart. Now the action certainly does matter. Action must follow belief to be true faith. So if you believe God wants you to give and you're not doing so, that is a sin. But if you're doing it from a place of resentment and compulsion, you're missing the entire gift in the giving. 
we can be willing to give because we trust the Lord. His ways are good. And he always provides for us. Then we experience the joy in giving. This creates a circular process of having and receiving all that we need. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you will fulfill the law of Christ. We want to support and encourage one another. And this is the law of Christ. Overall, the scripture teaches us that helping others brings blessing and happiness. And when we give generously and cheerfully, we not only help those in need, but we will also bring joy to ourselves. Now, the last principle I want to look at today is Happiness comes from having meaningful relationships. The Bible teaches that having meaningful relationships will bring us happiness. We see this in Proverbs 17, 17, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for times of adverse adversary. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10, two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up, but pity the one who falls and has no one to help him up. Proverbs 27, 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. Romans 12, 15, rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, therefore encourage one another, build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. Meaningful relationships with friends, family, and fellow believers can bring joy, support, and encouragement. We're not meant to go through life alone. We're called to love one another, support one another, and build each other up. This is what I think of when I talk about happiness. Life will have all the feelings, but joy and peace are always available at the center because these are not created by our circumstances, but by the spirit living in us. When we're willing to abide in Jesus and trust his goodness and faithfulness, allowing ourselves to feel it in our bones and take action, even when we don't feel like it, we're free. We're free to sing and dance and rejoice. We're free to have the happiest life. Thank you all for listening. Let's do it again next week. If you enjoyed this podcast, I would love to help you take this concept and apply it. Join me in Clarity and Courage, my cost-effective coaching program for Christian women. Each month, receive the tools you need to apply the concepts and grow. We will meet on a live coaching call where you can ask me anything. Plus, you get access to the worksheet workshop where you can have conversations with other women just like you. Learn more and sign up at myhappyvault.com backslash clarity and courage.